Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what part of the world. I'm Kevin Coyne and happy to share with you today uh, what we're doing around the Venture Outfitter. I'll bring my slides up because I always tend to forget them. But uh, today we're going to share four, five core tools that you can use for your venture and stuff like that. Um, welcome to the Venture Outfitter. Our whole work here is to discover talent, develop talent, connect talent to opportunity, and help it scale. In part of the, this is a program from the Tech Ranch that uh, we're starting to expand little by little by little, making polishing it every time. We we're just having a conversation behind the scenes where what we're saying is um, part of what we want to start doing is if you're ever interested in being part of the uh, internal audience and hearing some of the things that are happening around the scenes, please join us beforehand. We sometimes start just a little bit late right now, and that's just because I always like connecting to the community before we're officially recording. But uh, we'll, into the future, um, we're going to start doing that before the 11 o'clock hour, so join us early if you'd like. Thank you to Dual Works, Linda Blackman and her team for, the, uh, for being one of our consistent sponsors every week around the Venture Outfitter. Uh, if you're looking for office space, or if you're looking for office space or even a mailbox because your, your point of presence is outside of the country, look to them. They've made a lot of uh, really special offers available, and especially they, they host the Tech Ranch. So, um, and coming soon on the 30th, we were just mentioning about this, there are a number of you that are um, country managers. Uh, that is, that you have a specific country in the world from, you know, we were talking earlier, the Czech Republic to Uzbekistan. Uh, we just hosted a group from Uzbekistan. And part of what I want to do is I want to formalize the process of being a country manager. Um, what I mean by that is this, this isn't necessarily a paid position, but it's like if you have an area of concern, a country that you're concerned with because you live there or you have ethnic roots from that part, part of the world and you want to see that our network is tied into there, um, please make sure that you sign up. You can go to techranch.com slash connect, and there's a form there. And part of what we'll do is we'll do during this session on the 30th, we'll do an orientation. Um, but I want to make sure that uh, I know that we have Nigeria covered, we have Armenia covered, uh, we have South Korea and South Australia. I know that it's going to be at awkward times for for the non-US and America's crowd and the Euro European and African crowd, but I'm gonna to try to get us um, as much exposure as possible, so please join. And today, part of what we're gonna do is talk about sharing our tools. And you know, there's been a lot of different times that we'll just do community uh, events. We, you know, we have speakers at times and stuff like that. And I started realizing that part of what might be more interesting is that a lot of us study a lot. And, uh, you know, one of the things that an entrepreneur has to do is be an autodidact. And so um, today's, today's conversation or today's program is really going to be about uh, sharing tools. But I changed it a little bit. I decided that uh, I read a lot of books. I read about five books per month. Um, just because I am curious that way. And I'm going to start, uh, like, instead of just tools, which this was going to be like email templates and things like that, I thought there might be something that would be more valuable than, than just sharing about tools. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about five different books or five different um, pieces of uh, literature. Um, Three of them are books, and two of them are different concepts that would be important to, to engage in. And you might ask why. Well, it's interesting. There is an article that just came out. This is from, um, this is from the TechCrunch group. Uh, they launched this on their website called Protocol, protocol.com. They said that Y Combinator, Paul Graham and the guys at Y Combinator are saying there's going to be an economic downturn and you might as well plan for it and so part of what uh, I wanted to start doing was to say hey I, I, I kind of see some of the same things that they talk about in this article we will post the article into the um, in, into the uh, the show notes but part of the thing I want to make sure I say is um, 
we should start preparing for that. And so the five tools that I'm going to point to are going to be a different way of looking at that. The, 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 um, in this article that, that I'm referring to, they have a YouTube that has very practical, you know, it's a 35 minute, very practical, what do you do to, you know, cut your burn rate and set up the right conversations and stuff like that. All, all, the, all the outside extrinsic type of activities that you need to do around your startup to kind of battle proof it or, you know, prepare it for what's possibly going to happen. And I thought, hey, that's great. But part of what I want to make sure that we talk about is how do you battle proof yourself? And so the five tools are going to talk about that specifically. Um, now, I'm going to go through each one of them. I'll give you a little bit of an overview. Um, my overview for this is going to be really simplistic. I will be doing um, more book reviews onto my personal website, which is kevincoim.com. I have not published anything there in a, quite a while, but I'm, I'm just getting a hankering to start changing that out. And so, um, but each one of these books that I'm going to go through is quite interesting, and you can pick it up and go through it. Um, we might even have an area of the Slack channels that will go into more depth about it. But, uh, but let's just hop right in because part of what we need to do is hope for the best and plan for the worst with what's happening with the next steps that's, of what's happening. The first book that I'm going to refer to, which might be kind of surprising, is a book about trauma. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. It's by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Um, it's an interesting book in that a lot of what the research that's coming out that's been resisted by the uh, common knowledge for a very long time that uh, Dr. Uh, van der Kolk has been actually focused on is recognizing that a lot of times that we, we don't realize that traumatic events that have happened in our, our, in our history are embodied inside of our physicality. Like there is like a... You know, that, like as an example, in my case, there's a specific place on my hip that I, you know, got injured when I was a little kid. It happened around uh, times that, um, you know, a very, very, very contentious, traumatic part of my childhood history, and I still carry it, and it affects the whole right side of my body. Actually, probably affects my whole body. But uh, one of the things that the, Dr. Van der Kolk talks about in that is the the situation about how we need to constantly be aware of how this affects now what's interesting you know that might just be about how you feel and things like that but what's what's interesting is dr van der Kolk even goes to the point that says that part of the research is coming out that even some of the autoimmune diseases that there's a very strong correspondence between autoimmune diseases and underlying trauma that happened to individuals as, as children. This is breakaway research and the historic, you know, institution around psychiatry and psychology is actually resisting some of this new knowledge. Dr. Van der Poel um, even talks about that in the book. But because there's such a strong incidence, especially even in the United States, about autoimmune issues happening, part of the thing that's interesting to look at is how there might be some underlying set of issues that we want to look at. The book is extremely long. I'm, um, you know, I've been listening to the Audible. I've read, I have both the, the Kindle version and the Audible version. This is not a short read. And so part of the thing that you might look at is there's a number of different YouTube videos that go give you kind of a bite about it. But if you recognize, especially as we're going into kind of the rougher times, if you recognize that there's something holding you back and you want a good place to start to kind of look at that, this is an excellent book. This is an excellent book because it's provocative that Dr. Van der Poel actually takes the time to explain in layman's terms. Uh, I read a lot of stuff that's got, you know, very advanced, you know, I'm, I'm not a PhD, but I sometimes spend a lot of time on that sort of stuff. Dr. Van der Poel has really actually taken this work and made it accessible to us mere mortals uh, when it comes to studying about trauma and things like that. Um, definitely a interesting read. And the other net net of uh, things, you know, uh, many of you know that I've practiced Aikido for many years. He talks in the, in the book about you should have a yoga practice or a martial arts practice or something where you're in your body, perhaps more than just doing weights, 
so that you can actually figure out how to work through uh, the different issues that are showing up in the body. Very interesting book. Um, next one. So as we go through periods of time that are rough, uh, Man's Search for Meaning is another book that's quite interesting. It's quite provocative. It's, this one is actually very, very short comparatively. This is by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Viktor Frankl. Um, Dr. Frankl was a psychologist or a psychiatrist uh, that uh, was a Jewish person that was incarcerated in some of the worst situations in Nazi Germany during the war, World War II. Um, the first part of the book tells the, the history of what happened, and it's just absolutely disgusting. If you ever saw the, the movie Schindler's List, um, you saw, you know, some of the things that are referred to in Schindler's List, you actually see directly from Dr. Frankel's uh, words in the first part of the book. But the, the net net out of that first story was, how is it that this frail little man, Dr. Frankel says that he was actually, he wasn't as strong. He wasn't the strongest man that was incarcerated in, you know, entrapped in, the, um, in these terrible, horrible situations by the Nazis. But how is it that he, as this frail little man, was somehow able to make it through when he said there were men who were much tougher than him, much tougher than him, that uh, were able to uh, get through, uh, you know, that weren't able to, to deal with it, and then ended up dying under the conditions that were there. The, um, the, the, the net net of what um, he says is he developed a technique where he had more freedom than his captors. And then he went, in the second part of the book, he actually talks about this. He, call, he calls it logotherapy. Logotherapy, logos means meaning um, in Greek. And he says, essentially a saying is, you're searching for meaning. And you can find meaning in one of three ways. First off, the, uh, the work that you do, um, what, you know, uh, things that you do, your, your work or your uh, you know, like what what is you're doing and actually how can you cultivate that sense of meaning which a lot of us have you know we, we find meaning in the work that we do as entrepreneurs and so that is certainly one of the things to look into the second thing is the people we love right the the loves in your life and stuff like that and you know cultivating that sense of meaning and I think that there's really something that goes way beyond the, 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 when he's pointing to, like really developing deeper relationships than what's, what's typical. And then the third thing is in your suffering. And he makes a big distinction about suffering. And then he says, there's suffering where people bring it on themselves and they're responsible for creating their own crap. And then there's suffering of conditions that like he was under where you couldn't actually deal with, you know, it's like just dealing with the, the horrific of an, um, situation of being trapped. This, be, this book was actually one of the very, very, very first books that I read in my 20s when I actually, after I got my engineering degree and I didn't have courseware anymore, this was the book that actually kind of woke me up or was the first book out of the thousand book library that I went off to, you know, buy and read and stuff like that over the years. And um, I'll tell you quite truthfully, in February 22nd, 2009, at around 5 o'clock in the morning, as I got back from the ER of being assaulted by four guys in downtown Austin, and I knew that I had actually gone through a traumatic experience. There's three different elements of the trauma, and I can tell you about that in a different thing. One of the first things I did after getting my nose stitched up because I had had my nose shattered by brass knuckles and I had to fight quite literally my way out of what had happened. The first thing I did once I got, you know, home and a little bit of some food in me was I went back to this book and I cracked it open and I started rereading it. We go through hard situations as entrepreneurs. And the thing that I think is interesting is to, to actually have a practice because some of us are choosing the hardest situation that we possibly can for work. Some of us don't have a choice, right? Many of the countries that are represented by our members live in places where you couldn't just go get a job. In the United States, you can usually just go get a job. You want a job, you can get a job. But many of us are actually foregoing getting a job and we're making a choice to be in a situation where there is a process of pain and suffering just through our work. 
And I want to point to this book because it's so very valuable. For me, having the reminder on that, you know, on the morning of the 23rd, and, you know, on the 2009, when I, as I sat there and said, what the hell just happened? And, you know, part of the thing about that, there's a whole story about that, too, because I actually experienced my own aggressive side, which I was, I had PTSD as much from my own uh, violent response to getting attacked by four guys as much as I had the response of actually, you know, having, being assaulted. The, 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 the pages of this book, were extremely valuable for me. And there are many times as I deal with difficult situations myself that I actually reminded, I'm reminded of the words of this book. Now, Dr. Frankel went through a really crappy situation being, you know, being uh, stuck in one of the Nazi concentration camps. And I'm not going to say that my little experience had anything, like there was no level of comparison between the two. But still, I think as entrepreneurs, as we look at situations that we're having to deal with, this is actually a really valuable thing. Going right ahead, um, the third book that I think is interesting is Dr. Carolyn Elliott wrote a book called Existential Kink. Okay, so why this book? Why this book? This is actually on the other end of the spectrum, and it's interesting. Um, it's kind of funny the way that we came to this book. Um, and there's a whole story about that that I'll share at a different time. But in the book, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Elliot, what she says is, what she says is that there is an interesting set of situations that had. She actually refers to Carl Jung, you know, uh, Carl Jung, the psychologist. She says, Carl Jung's, one of his most famous statements is, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule you and you will call it fate. It will rule your life and you will call it fate. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. What does she mean by that? Or what, what did Carl Jung mean by that? And how is Dr. Elliot actually applying that? There are recurring patterns that we all go through, that especially when we're, um, especially when we're expressing our own victimization about something that happened. And every time we tell our victim story, we're getting a dopamine hit. That could come from, like as an example, I deal with depression on a daily basis. And you know, there's times that I find myself say, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. Like, because, you know, I had all this stuff happen when I was a child, or I have this former business partner that blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, I had a former business partner who embezzled funds and, you know, really made it hard as hell. And they almost cost me a, a business and blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and there's value to getting those stories out there. But then there are certain times, and each one of us has this. It's not just unique to me or any one of you. It's, we all have this. There's times where that story goes over and over and over and over and over. And you might ask, why is it that we tell those stories over and over and over? It's because we get a dopamine hit. You know, it's like the, in the, uh, the little uh, pellet that they say you, you push the button or the monkey pushes the button so he can get a cocaine pellet. Then the cocaine ends up creating a dopamine hit. Well, even without anything like cocaine or anything like that, if you find yourself stuck in a rut over and over and over, telling a story that you've processed a thousand times, I'm not saying don't tell it, but what I am saying is that there might be something that's happening that's holding you into that position that you should be aware of. So Dr. Elliot, interesting enough, she tells her story. She used to be into bondage and S&M and all sorts of crazy things. She used to be into that sort of stuff. And part of what she says is she recognized through her own recovery process, uh, she was going through a, a, a recovery process for alcohol, if I remember right, from the book. And she actually said that, what is it that's happening that's creating this pattern over and over and over? And in the, in the case of, of addiction, 
you know, we all have addiction at some point. Dopamine is set up that way. We want to actually experience the, you know, the, the, the energy of whatever it might be that might be addiction. For an alcoholic, it's picking up alcohol. For someone else, it might be something else. For an angerholic, for someone who gets angry all the time, even at the most light little thing, that, that whole thing, it creates a pattern. Well, so one of the things that Dr. Elliot was actually saying in the book is she said she recognized some of the patterns that when she was a dominatrix as in, in S&M happened to be some of the same type of things that happened over here with addiction patterns. And so going back to what she says, and she says the Carl Jung quote, at least 60 times during the course of the book, but I think it really in emphasizes, and so I'll, I will say it again, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. If there's something that's happening over and over and over, it's not fate. There's probably some underlying type of issue. Whether you call it karma or woo-woo or whatever it might be, there's probably something there that if you can make that visible, then um, if you can make that visible, then there's something that you can actually do something about it. You can actually say, hey, wait, the following pattern keeps on happening. And let me make that visible. Now, what's interesting about it is, and she's very playful in the way she talks about this, that in the concept of S&M, you know, S&M sadomechanism, where, you know, people are beating on each other or whatever they're doing, whatever crazy kind of crap they're doing. Uh, she says that we do this to ourselves to whatever the pattern that we're constantly caught up in. Um, the, uh, the, the pattern over and over and over, whatever it might be, and that we get our own kink out of that. That's why she calls this existential kink. It's like, because you're human, you have some of these things. Quite interesting book. It was quite provocative initially um, when I when I read about it, and it's kind of funny the way she tells it, because she tells it with, uh, you know, a little bit of an entertaining kind of kink thing, which I think in some ways makes it more accessible, because we're talking about, again, traumatic type of things that we lock onto, that we have addiction to, that we live in over and over and over, and like as an example, as, uh, as your lead uh, whiner and complainer at times, right? You know, I'm like, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. I think in everyone that's in the studio audience, except for maybe Raj, has heard me whine about something. And I'm starting to say, after reflecting on this book, I'm like, wait, what's the dopamine hit that I'm getting out of telling this same sad story over and over and over? Um, I just offer that up as provocative to think through because it is interesting to say, it's just something to look at. It's just something to look at. And the book is quite provocative. I listened to this one on Audible. Uh, we'll make sure that there's a link uh, in the show notes for this, but quite interesting about that. So the uh, next thing that I'll actually click on over to though, is an article. So instead of a book this time, I actually thought, well, so if you, you know, you, the body keeps the score, there's trauma embedded all the way back from your childhood there, maybe even from previous groups, you know, Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, can actually help you handle some of the crap that's happening. Um, Dr. Elliot's book about existential kink kind of tell us, tells us a little bit more about how you might be addicted to that whole process over and over and over. And then this article came out. It says, want to dramatically lower your feelings of anxiety and stress. Science and Jeff Bezos, and there's other people, I don't know why they called out Jeff Bezos, says, stop clumping. What is clumping? So something happens bad in the morning. You know, you have a bad conversation in the morning, and then someone cuts you off at the, uh, in, in the middle of the day as you're driving into your office. And then the next thing, you get the, uh, the, you get the nasty gram, like, I just got a letter in the mail as I walked into the office. And I'm like, oh, crap, there's another bill. Or, oh, wait, I screwed up something on the IRS forms and stuff like that. And, and there might have been, like, 10 things that happened. And those 10 things all together... Then you go back into that woe is me thing. Um, and the idea of clumping is you clump them all together. Both uh, 
Dr. Van der Kohl's book in The Body Keeps the Score, as well as in this article, part of what they're saying, and the article is very short compared to Dr. Van der Kohl's The, you know, the Body Keeps the Score book. In this article, part of what he says about this whole process is be very granular about the feelings that you're feeling. Dr. Vanderpool actually says, put specific words about what you're feeling. Something happened. Oh, okay. I instead of feeling I'm upset, which is kind of uh, in general, uh, you know, maybe maybe something happened where I feel indignant that the following thing happened. You notice. Upset is kind of like a namby-pamby. It's not really clear about how you feel, but indignant actually really describes a very specific feeling. Perhaps it shows up in your body in a very specific place. And by identifying each granular little feeling, you can get more attention on it and have it dissipate. Whereas if you allow the whole day to say, wow, crap, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, Part of what ends up being a problem is all that all clumped together will crush you. But if you can actually start thinking through, what is it I specifically feel? Oh, wait, that guy cut me off and I'm angry. I'm angry. I'm angry about that. And, and instead of like just suppressing your anger, you can say, I'm freaking angry because of the following thing. Versus, you know, um, instead of just being sad, what are you really feeling? Like you're not just feeling sad. Sad, sad, sad's like a sad's a fine word, but the problem is, if you can actually say, "Oh wait, I'm feeling grief for the breakup that happened last year," and I'm feeling grief because I really miss the following elements, it'll instead of you know some some of us have been taught in the past, well you don't want to wallow in it, but the problem is if you just say, "Well I'm sad," versus going down and actually identifying a specific feeling. And, and digging into it so you know what the feeling is. And you can say, okay, I see that feeling. Great, I understand what's going on. Now I can do something about it. Uh, that's, that's the whole idea here. Um, the, uh, the, the thing that I think would be interesting is because we are entering into a time that uh, if you believe the article I just posted about why combinators saying, hey, get ready for the, you know, the, the nuclear winter for investments and stuff like that. This really interesting, it, it, it's really interesting to say, let's get more sophisticated um, about how we're processing emotions. Entrepreneurs have to be some of the most sophisticated people because we've got employees um, depending on us and we got all sorts of different things and we don't have enough money for the missions that we're taking on and different things like that. So to get through the feeling faster, and the crappy situations faster, don't clump them. Get really specific. Let's get nuanced about that. I'm actually seriously, seriously, seriously considering with all the different things that I've been studying about trauma and how to process trauma. And since entrepreneurs have to be what I call self-cleaning ovens, you know, it's like the oven gets used over and over and over but you got to keep on cleaning it, right? You do, it's like, oh, wait, I went to counseling 10 years ago. No, we have something we have to do on a daily basis. This is a good example. You have to have the practices of actually how to get, get through that. Um, let's see, Paulina just said, when cutting off the example, I asked myself how much I hate rudeness or a person that, that have to have not standing in their own life circumstance to hurt others. So she's talking about someone cut her off in traffic and, you know, what is it that that person has going on? That is another good thing is to, um, one of the things that psychologists have said and one of my previous coaches that I was a, I, I, I was the player, he was the coach. He would say, when in doubt, focus out. What he means by that is, ties directly into what Paulina is saying in that, Sometimes when someone does something idiotic, like, you know, cut you off or whatever it might be, or, you know, is rude to you in a different context, part of the thing that can actually help really do that, and it ties into this clumping um, sense, is to really understand, okay, what's going on over there with that person? When in doubt, focus out. That is, what's going on inside of that person's heart or head or whatever. So that's another great thing to do. Let's get to the, the fifth thing. Um, in a coming VO Weekly, I'm actually thinking about inviting a meditation coach. Um, I haven't decided which one, and I'd really like to get your feedback because I don't know if the community 
would like this or not. So um, please chat chat this or text me about it or whatever and tell me what you think. But the, uh, the thing that I'm actually wondering is, so for me, I started doing meditation as part of my martial art practice many years ago. I was exposed to something called um, Rinzai Zen. And, you know, Zen or whether it's through one of the Vedic type of meditation practices or just you sitting on your chair, breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth, with a straight back, doesn't have to be a religious context at all. Um, that can be really, 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 really powerful. And so the, the thing that actually I want to suggest to you is if you don't have a practice, if you don't have a practice of meditation, and I don't mean tied to any kind of religious kind of context because I, I'm, I'm Christian, I did all the Zen Buddhism stuff, it really benefited me because I've been able to manage through um, lots of different shit storms, and I'm sorry to use that language, but it, the truth is e each one of us are up against really hard situations. And if you don't have a practice to calm yourself down and to you know put some pennies in the, uh, into the bank so you actually have stuff in the future, um, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. And I promise you, if you do six weeks of only five minutes a day of just sitting, not doing anything, straight back, breathing, in through the nose, out through the mouth. And I, I don't, and even though I've been doing meditation uh, and, been, and, and was trained all the way back to 99, I don't consider myself an expert. There are other people that have even gone deeper. But I promise six weeks of five minutes a day, only five minutes a day, um, you will get addicted to it and it's a good addiction because even as I did this example right now, I can already feel the serotonin release into my body and kind of makes me feel a little bit more joyful. And the nice thing about this is it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything at all. And so if we are in the process that we're going, we're just about to have to face, uh, you know, really difficult situations, uh, you know, the market itself, not to mention we got a war going on, we got all these different things, just breathing, just learning how to breathe well. One of the, um, one of the Indian masters that I met, I mentioned a few weeks ago that, uh, that I met His Holiness uh, Sri Sri, um, or he's called Guru Dev uh, Sri Sri. Um, one of the things he was he was making fun of Westerners. Actually, he wasn't making fun of Westerners. He was just trying to like be playful about it and saying, people in the West don't know how to breathe. And what he means by that is just this simple little practice of just taking a a uh, a little bit of a moment out to breathe can make a major difference. Um, David just posted something into the chat, and what we'll do is. This is um, what well, we'll we'll turn off the uh, the slides because I went through the ones that we actually shared. I'd love to hear from you guys about what you um, uh, you know. You might reflect. You might have questions on one of the five uh, things I just proposed. You might have questions about the actual uh, the article from uh, you know the article from the TechCrunch guys at Protocol or the Protocol uh, periodical at TechCrunch. But um, I'd love to actually interact a little bit. I know David Potas, who is also another martial artist, he studies jujitsu. I study Aikido. He might have something to say. But when he said, he just said, when someone does something that makes me mad, like cutting, uh, cutting me off, I always tend to think that people are more clueless than ill-intentioned. They don't mean harm, and it helps me calm myself down. Uh, late, late comment on the past um, um, point. David, maybe go ahead and say something. I mean, I, I'd like to actually get... Um, I'd like to get some interaction about these. You know, these are just five tools. By the way, one of the other things that I want you guys to give me feedback about is, since I read so much, when we actually have one of these times that we don't have a speaker, I'm thinking, I'm going to start doing book reports. I, I miss that part of school. You know, my reads on books can be a little bit weird compared to others, but I'd love to get y'all's feedback about that. David Potas, um, it looked like you came off of mute to say something. Go ahead, ahead and, and, uh, and, and join us and 
um, share your insight because I know you've got a martial arts background as well. You've got some insight about this sort of stuff. You've also been a, up against some big challenges for building your business. What do you have to say about all these things? Um, yes, thank you, Kevin. Um, so basically, uh, I mean, a couple of things. I, I, I do suffer, I mean, I have been diagnosed with, uh, uh, how do you call it in English? Uh, I mean, just anxiety, but I don't know what is the uh, clinical term. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of things I've tried to use myself and in, in, in terms of helping me with my anxiety, uh, both in my personal life and uh, also in business. Um, many of the things you just said, I, I do, for example, um, I tend to, and this is, I mean, I'm going to say it pretty easily, but it's something that I struggle with and I tend to put a lot of effort in just trying to find what is what is causing my anxiety, for example, just to think, okay, is this problem specific? Is this something about, I don't know, uh, financial issues or something specific? And then tend to think if, if it's something that I can, um, I can solve right now, is this something, because most of the, the time when I suffer from anxiety is when I try to go to sleep and my, my head just starts to, to think about a lot of things and, and all the problems at the same time. And Again, that's when, uh, like you mentioned, my, my, uh, my, the martial arts experience helps. Uh, and this specifically about jiu-jitsu. Uh, I don't know if anybody of you have heard what, what is jiu-jitsu specifically, but there's a lot of technique and there's very specific techniques, the very specific uh, structure system that you need to follow. To, I, mean, I mean, tools that you, you can have to, to either grapple or just you know, practice jiu-jitsu. So, so when I'm you know, struggling with this type of things and just trying to, to concentrate a little bit, I tend to go back to, you know, the last class I had and, 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 and try, try to think again of the technique and, you know, where does my right hand have to go, where my feet has to go. So it's kind of like in a simple way, kind of like meditation in the sense of, uh, you know, my mind starts to focus on one specific thing so I can just calm down and then start again when my, uh, you know, fa uh, facing what I what was need to face. Um, and the other thing is just what I was mentioning in the comments is that, uh, you know, something that I, I share a lot with my wife because, uh, you know, and just again, the very simple example is when you're driving in traffic and somebody cuts you off and, and my wife is more temperamental and she's like, oh, look at this idiot, whatever, he's trying to get inside in front of us in line. And I tend to, to say, you know, I, I always think that people are more clueless than, than you know, that that they don't have bad intentions. They're not trying to get in front of you in line. They're not trying to uh, cut you off in, 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 a, in a bad sense. It just didn't, they didn't see you. They didn't, they didn't know you were there. And, and they're probably, um, and in that sense, uh, you know, a lot, and that applies to a lot of things in life. I mean, just to think that it's not personal against you, it helps me a lot to, to approach the, the problem, whatever it is, in a different, in a different uh, uh, you know, uh, different approach. So, I mean, that's one of the things that I do. Uh, definitely just uh, jujitsu does sold me a lot. I mean, actually, I, I did a, a video uh, about it for a, for a class that I took a long time ago, how uh, jujitsu helps me actually, martial arts helps me with the, you know, facing things. And just, again, other, another thing about, about jujitsu is that uh, it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> that's something that you probably won't sell you get to practice jiu-jitsu but it's really uncomfortable to practice jiu-jitsu because you're always in very complicated positions and situation and i find something about trying to be comfortable on uncomfortable situations that helps me with my daily life and you know how to face things uh you know just everyday things and and, and, and yeah so that's my my approach on yeah, no, I think that, that ties totally into what I, I, um, I was laughing because, so the scar that I have right here, what it's a, what, a four inch scar, um, four inch scar of where I lost use of this arm because it was put into a position like this, a position that, uh, you know, is like uh, um, Aikido, the martial art I've practiced for 20 something years is like, uh, it has the same root of, of, as jujitsu, right? The, the, the you know, jujitsu and Aikido, they're kind of related. And so my arm was in this position and uh, I went, my body went this way, it should have gone that way. Mega lunge was short, pop, the, uh, the bicep tendon rolled up and um, 
you know, I had to have surgery to put it back together. And the thing about it is, like, the, what a pain in the ass that was when it happened. But because I had been practicing for such a period of time, exactly what David's saying is there. Like, I was able to calm myself down and work through what just happened. So having a practice like a martial art is really valuable because you constantly have to deal with the situation. I, I didn't understand why I loved, uh, or actually I didn't love meditation initially. I really found it irritating until um, I recognized that in the middle of getting, in Aikido, instead of focusing on one-on-one -on -one attacker, you actually have this multiple attacker kind of situation. And it can be really overwhelming when four people are attacking at once. And what do you do? You know, it's not one-on-one. -on -one. It's, it, it's it, you're actually having to deal with a different kind of stressor. What I started noticing is by practicing the, the um, practicing the meditation, there would be a moment that I could drop in, in the middle of all the fracas. And, and immediately be able to say, hey, wait, I'm okay. Now, as a simulated attack, you know, now when I did get assaulted, one of the reasons that I did so well in, in not getting overwhelmed by my attackers, I mean, they, they got the first punch in, and the first punch had brass knuckles, so it really sucked that I had a shattered nose. But the thing about it is, I was able to be okay because I was able to ground myself. That's that's where this sort of stuff can be really valuable for us. Like, uh, and you don't have to go into a martial art to get the the value of the grounding that David's pointing to. Um, you know, you can just breathe five minutes a day, and it'll 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 start to get you there. It's interesting. So yeah, thanks for the perspective. I totally agree with it. Um, it's uh, Kim just asked in the chat. What are the top couple of things someone could consider? to adopt your meditation practice. Time of day, environment, no dogs around. Uh, I don't consider myself an expert. Um, the, uh, I do have more than a couple of decades of meditation. Um, during, um, during COVID, I meditated 414 days in a row, somewhere between 30 minutes to three hours a day, right? That was how I was like, okay, there's a lot of stress. Like in, you know, we did all sorts of stuff. I don't know that I found any particular time of the day other than the one thing that I noticed is that when I meditate in the morning, um, I, when I was doing that insane amount of meditation, I was doing 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the evening to really calm down. The evening was helping me sleep. The morning was helping me set my day in order. Um, you know, I've, I've had historically a really bad insomnia and, um, and so that, and it, I don't think you have to do 30 minutes. I was doing it because I was desperate, right? They say if you're, uh, you know, if you're running around and you have no time for anything, instead of meditating 10 minutes, you should meditate 30, right? They actually, it's kind of a funny thing because when I do meditate, it, um, I end up having more time because I've got more mental space. But the most important thing, let me try to mimic this, is to sit with the back straight, pick a time, um, that, that works for you. Uh, even here in my office, I will try to show you. I bought a chair. I don't know if you can see it over there since we're limited. I bought a chair that, that is really nice to just sit. Now, I like to sit, you know, Indian style, you know, cross-legged. I don't do the what's called the full lotus or anything like that. You don't have to get like that. Just sit with your, uh, your butt on the seat your feet on the ground, or something where you actually feel solid, some type of solid connection to the earth. That's really important, and I didn't believe that for the first five years or so, but I now believe it, um, that there's something about just feeling really supported. Breathe in through your nose, which engages the parasympathetic nervous system, and you can breathe out through your mouth. You can breathe out through your nose too, but I think that part of the feeling that you'll get if you just take a second right now in Dr. Vandervolk's um, book, it even says that at the end of the breath, just hesitate a little bit before you start the next cycle. Like on the in breath, hold for a second hold for a second don't try to just like do it like mechanically those are important um 
I know that when I do it in the morning, uh, when I do it in the morning, the rest of the world is happier because I'm not, you know, those of you who know me well know that I have lots of edges. Is, 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 uh, <laughs> I have lots of edges and I end up having less edges if I just do it in the morning. Um, the evening is more for me with sleep. The morning is more for that. Uh, yesterday, actually, uh, was it two days ago, though, um, I recognized some really crappy... I'm having to deal with the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, and they really screwed up something concerning my dad's health care. And I was quite angry. And it's not that I was yelling, but I actually can be a pain in the ass when I'm angry because of, um, I'm actually having a, sorry for the story, but they actually have this paper-based process that would be appropriate in the 1980s, but is not appropriate in the year 2022. Um, and they lost my paperwork from my father to get him services and stuff like that. And I was really pissed off. So the right time was right after that conversation because no one else needed to experience me coming out of the really aggressive conversation with the Health and Human Services Commission. Um, the, no one else needed to do that, so just having a second for a second was good. So it could just be that you do it as needed as well. I do think, though, that there's something that emerges. Uh, you know, for the entrepreneurs, there. Um, I won't use his name, but there's another entrepreneur. Um, that is a long, long-term tech rancher and actually became one of our, our instructors, in fact, that uh, one time was just about to jump off the oblivion and, and destroy his startup because he's, he'd had enough. And uh, make a long story short, part of what I asked him to do, and I think it was helpful, was uh, just the five minutes a day. And he ended up, um, you know, he ended up doing that, the net net, all these years later, um, he just got his company funded to the next level, and um, he's doing it amazing. Like, and so I think that just even if you were to make a commitment to yourself to do five minutes a day, um, you know, for you know five days a week, and just keep to it, that uh, it will be it will become addictive, and you'll end up having more time for it. Uh, one of the other things, Paulina says that she says that she listens to calming wave music as well. If you don't have wave music, one of the things that you can do is there's a number of different um, things online. As an example, uh, one of the things that lines up with what uh, she's saying that I happen to have right here on my uh, on YouTube, as an example, there's a bunch of deep focus music. Uh, it says ADHD relief. Yeah, I'm probably a little bit ADHD myself, but I listen to this as well. I do use a very nice pair of Sony uh, headphones. And um, yeah, so what Paulina is saying, that actually is part of my practice as well. And a lot of times when I'm doing deep thought work, um, by having that wave type of music come up, it actually can be really helpful as well. I'm wondering, does anyone else have anything that they wanted to share or suggestions they'd like to add into the episode before we close it up for the day? Just checking out to see all the different things. David Nichols raised his hand. David Nichols, our Texan in the Czech Republic. David, go ahead. Uh, it's not really related to this, uh, like your theme today. Should I start? Yeah, no, 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 no it's worries. Not, they, it's, it's we can always do uh, we're a community, not not a. This is a, this is a community, not necessarily a program. So that's perfect. Tell me about it. Okay, so it's about surprise Ukraine, and when I was in uh, on this trip to the USA, uh, the the whole the, the like the underlying message was about you know uh, doing business with your uh, with. Um, with countries, your like your allies, your friends that have the same values and protecting those values, right? So uh, what we were looking at, you know, we, we see the war in Ukraine uh, and we, uh, the whole thing is we're thinking about the value of democracy, the value of free societies, uh, the value of the rule of law right? and to, to continue uh, to really push that. And so very funnily enough, we're also talking to people from Taiwan, you know, yeah, obviously, I guess, right? They're very much paying attention to what's going on in uh, in Europe and how the world is reacting. 
but uh, so one of, one of the things I was pushing for was a uh, like a, a, a solidarity mission to Kyiv to uh, you know show the Ukrainians you know we do support them we, we it, we're not just sending them you know uh, bullets or whatever but we actually care about them and their lives are valuable and, and to find a way you know to really you know, help make that more concrete that, that it is about democracy, that it is about the rule of law, because Ukraine is an incredibly corrupt country and it's got a long way to go to build up their civil society and stuff. And what the people talked to me on the trip about was, it seems like that's actually a really cool idea, but they were, what they were saying is that it put it in more of an economic context about the upcoming re reconstruction of Ukraine, because there's going to be a huge amount of uh, work to be done there. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. Yeah, the idea is that the countries that have provided the most support to Ukraine will probably get the biggest part of the business. That means USA, UK, Czech Republic, you know, uh, Poland, uh, countries like that. And so uh, I'm working on this. Uh, I'm working on this with um, talking to people in the Czech government right now and uh, also in the Taiwanese government, believe it or not. And uh, so I just thought I would mention it that if anybody's interested in it, uh, I'd be happy to keep you updated. Kevin, I, I bet you would be interested, probably, especially. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested. Yeah, uh, yeah obviously, with, uh, with what's happening, um, as we were mentioning, you know, before the show began about uh, kicking off our, our country manager project. Part of what I want to see happen is, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's, let, let's definitely take advantage of that and, and work together from that standpoint. I'll be talking to, um, Congressman Doggett's office. Uh, this next week specifically about the relationship that that he supports with regards to the Czech Republic and then you know as, as I mentioned as I mentioned on the program where we uh, we've now had three programs focused on Ukraine um, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to having that next drink in Kiev and uh, in Kiev yeah. and in yeah. Lviv uh, yeah. as well to like uh, I mean, I, I I can already see that it's going to happen, and so, um, yeah, yeah. and part of it is also our relationships in Moldova, in Lithuania, Latvia, yeah. Estonia, um, Poland. You know, uh, even even the people that I was meeting from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, mm -hmm. and Turkmenistan. Mm -hmm. uh, when I you know they actually asked me, and earlier this week we hosted a. A group from those uh, the five those five stands, in or the five stand company uh, countries, the um, the the thing that actually um, we're saying is exactly that right you know it's it's like how is it that we work together to to build a better future so yeah I'm I'm keenly interested. Um, we have one of our interns on right now. His name is Raj, um, and he is, uh, or he's in the studio audience. Part of what he's working on as well is doing some of the research around that, David, so you might keep him in the loop as well. And uh, the summer project he's going to work on is, I've already given him some of the U.S. State Department documents that came out that we saw. We haven't yet figured out who to be plugging into at the State Department, so if you happen to have an idea, um, I'll be unabashed about saying, hey, um, you know, let us know, because uh, we've had more connections directly with Ukraine than we have with our own um, government. So we're well, hoping it, it might be a great way to go through the Ukrainians, but for sure, having political sport, you know, to be positioned as a part of the recovery is not only something that can fulfill us like, uh, hey, we're, we're, we're helping to make the world a better place. It could be really important business, both for Ukraine and for us that take part in that. And so that, that is sort of like the way to bring it all together. It's not just, you know, emotions and, and uh, whatever. It's also, you know, there's a concrete, a concrete business case there too, but it will need political support. I believe. And I don't know how much, uh, you know, the State Department will do and how much, who, you know, what do you, I bet, you know, Ukraine is going to have a huge say in what goes on, but they are definitely going to favor those countries that they see has been the most supporting of them. And the USA is right there. Czech Republic is there. So... That sounds good. Well, part of what we'll be doing is the there is a, a small group of Ukrainians that have been involved in TechCrunch. Um, in fact, one of my former employees, I just got a hold of um, her name, first name is Tatiana. Um, we'll be back in contact with her and we've done projects uh, with uh, software development projects um, all the way back to 2007, 2008 
with a team out of uh, out of Lviv. Um, so uh, or Lviv, I gotta learn how to say it. I'll I'll get my tongue right Lviv. at some point. Lviv. Lviv. Um, Lviv. Yeah, L V I V. Just think of it like Lviv. French. Lviv. Lviv. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, well, so we're making a point to do that. Um, I know that uh, uh, I know that we're coming. To, well, thank you, David, for sharing that. What we'll do is uh, we'll make sure that we do that. If anyone hears the uh, the process, and David, make sure that you do this as well, um, if you haven't already. Uh, if you do have a country that you'd like to represent in the network, and or it could even be a region inside of a country, like as an example, this last week we started interacting with the Romanians out of Cluj and um, the uh, please get onto our radar on June 30th if you missed this at the beginning of this uh, segment part of what we're going to do is we're going to have an or orientation about how to be involved as a country manager in TechCrunch and you don't have to have a formal positioning or stuff like that like as an example one of the uh, states of Mexico that we have connection with is a low-level person that happens to live in that state that said she was like hey I really want our state to have some visibility um, in what's happening and now you know so in Mexico we've got the state by state basis it could be other other countries and stuff like that like uh, I'm gonna be reaching back out to my friend that lives in Bhutan because uh, she's come and spoke to us before as well um, but uh, make sure you sign up. If you're not on the newsletter, make sure you get on the newsletter as well. We will start posting more activities. We're going to start really ramping up the community usage so people can actually take advantage of that. A lot of these activities are free, so uh, take advantage of that. And we will do more, um, more research about that soon. David, sometime soon, I'd like to have you actually come back and do the Czech Republic report along with some of our friends that are in, in Brno as well. We'll have them come back as well. But uh, with that, what we'll, yeah, sounds great. I look forward to it. With that, what we'll do is uh, it's always an honor to be here with a group of entrepreneurs that are driven by vision and values. Let's go change the world for the better together. With that, we'll call it closed for today. Y'all take care and be safe, and let's go change the world for the better together. Take care. <laughs>